Welcome to the Association of College and Research Library Science and Technology Sections Information Literacy Committee's monthly chat. My name is Bonnie Fong and I am the co-chair of the ACRL STS Information Literacy Committee. This month, our chat discussion leader is Elizabeth Berman. Elizabeth Berman is the an associate library professor and the science and engineering librarian at the University of Vermont. She has been an active member of STS since 2007. Her scholarship revolves around information literacy in the sciences and scientific literacy. From 2010 to 2011, she chaired the ACRL Science and Technology Section's Information Literacy Standards for Science and Engineering Technology Five-Year Review Task Force. She is currently a member of the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards for Higher Education Task Force, which reviewed and is currently revising the information literacy standards for the first time since they were published in 2000. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your willingness to lead our chat today. Um, I'm going to transfer the podium over to you. And um, there you go. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. So first, um, I'm very thrilled to be here. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Second, I totally tweaked the title and topic of today's chat pretty much because I could. Um, actually, I, I tweaked the title for two reasons. Uh, one, the work of the information, information literacy standards revision is really in a beta form. Um, and so I didn't know that I could fill up an entire hour uh, just talking about that. And then second, I really wanted to circle this conversation back around, make this chat more centered around the sciences. It is an STS chat, I'm aware of that. So I hope you guys are cool with me making these changes, but I guess you don't really have a choice. So um, let me see if I can figure this out. Okay, so here's just the general outline of what I'm planning and talking today. So I wanna do just a quick background, brief history of the information literacy standards for science and engineering technology. Um, I wanted to then talk about the revision of the ACRL information literacy standards. And there I'm going to get into some of the details of the foundational concepts that are really driving um, our revision to the model. And then I kind of want to wrap up, um, bring again back full circle, how this work impacts information literacy models in the sciences or how it could impact information literacy models in the sciences. So what I'm planning on doing is sort of giving you some information, and then I want to provide an open space for discussion. And I did sort of integrate some question prompts if we need them. So that's the plan. So history of information literacy standards, and in particular, um, the information literacy standards for science and technology engineering. Um, and 2006, STS was actually one of the first ACRL sections to publish discipline-specific information literacy standards based really on the information literacy standards for higher education. The standards that were published in 2006 focus on five competencies. So the information literate student determines the nature and extent of the information needed. The information literate student acquires needed information effectively and efficiently. The information literate student critically evaluates the procured information and its sources, and as a result, decides whether or not to modify the initial query and or seek additional sources, and whether to develop a new research process. The information literate student understands the economic, ethical, legal, and social issues surrounding the use of information and its technologies, and either as an individual or as a member of a group, uses information effectively, ethically, and legally to accomplish a specific purpose, and the information literate student understands that information literacy is an ongoing process and an important component to lifelong learning. And it recognizes the need to keep current regarding new developments in his or her field. So there you have a very long definition of the five different competencies. I do see, yes, um, the SLA chemistry division does have specific standards related to chemistry. Um, the engineering, um, EELD, ASV, EE, uh, they, I believe, have created at least crosswalks to the science and technology standard. Um, so it's not the only science-based one out there, but it was, again, one of the first. 
and I just have to say it's so weird talking to myself. I wish there were more voices. Um, so STS review of information literacy standards for science and engineering. So ACRL requires uh, that discipline-specific standards get reviewed every five years. So in 2010, STS Council formed a task force to review the science and engineering information literacy standards. The task force, which I chaired, recommended that the standards be revised based on six broad trends, which I've listed there. So define lifelong learning. As a profession, we talk about lifelong learning a lot, but the term has been overused to the point where it has virtually made the statement meaningless. So in terms of science and engineering, what does lifelong learning mean? All right. Uh, sequence competencies. So the standard is currently presented just in order, standard one, standard two, standard three, standard four, standard five, but offer little acknowledgement as to when or where the concepts could or should be systematically and strategically integrated into the student's education. Um, information consumption versus information production. I think this is perhaps one of the biggest areas that the standards are currently lacking. Students don't just consume information, but also produce it in a variety of formats. Data, digital objects, games, simulations, right? So we need a model that acknowledges information literacy as the sum total of information consumption and information production. Problem-based and active learning. So a trend in the science curricula is a movement away from traditional lecture-based instruction in favor of more problem-based or active learning. This movement forces us to adopt a model of contextualizing information literacy within a much larger landscape. Complementary literacy. So information literacy does not stand alone. There are a number of other literacy students in the sciences need. Computer literacy, technological literacy, media, visual, data literacy, right? So how do these literacies interact within the curriculum and with information literacy? And then finally, professional skills. Um, in addition to being proficient in scientific and technical competencies, students in the sciences and engineering need to demonstrate skill in communicating, creative and critical thinking, teamwork. Information literacy contributes significantly to all of these soft skills, but direct connections between information literacy and the skills are often lacking. Um, so the STS Council approved the recommendation to revise, but we tabled the revisions pending the work of the ACRL information literacy standards revision, knowing that a bigger change is sort of on the horizon. So that's sort of the background. I did want to take a break here and open it up for discussion. Um, you know, the question I have posed here, are there other significant areas that should be considered in a revision of the information literacy standards for science and engineering? So I'm curious if people want to chime in on that or if you have other questions about what I've presented so far. scholarship um, undergraduate research. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Right, undergraduate programs are more engaged in research and STEM. So Sue asked, could the other professional skills you have listed be a part of information literacy? <laughs> no one could tell you fast enough. Um, you know, that's the question is where, it's a very complex system that we have to play here, the skills, work with information literacy. And so I think that becomes a question is how, how do we get this, how do we get research, information literacy, um, the soft skills, all working together in the same arena because we're all working towards the same end goal, but we're not always working cohesively, coherently, um, 
or even calling it the same thing. Right, and these lists, they can go on and on. There are infinite numbers of skills that we may be able to identify, um, infinite numbers of literacies. So where do we get to enough is enough? And Linda's saying research integrity seems to be more more important, and I absolutely agree. I think the ethics piece of um, IL tends to be downplayed, um, or at least not discussed as much as it really needs to be. Now, Bruce, what do you mean a list of resources that students should know? Okay, so you're getting down to a very specific level of instruction, um, specific databases. And I guess that opens up an interesting question. Should we be focusing on very specific, uh, fine-tuned skills, knowledge, or should we be looking more broadly at uh, information concepts generally? Because Bruce makes a good point. Everything, databases, information is always changing. Um, even in the two years since we've done our review uh, with STS, the landscape has changed. Bonnie Fong, uh, what about graduate students other than the sciences studying more professional programs? I'm not sure I understand that question. Right, uh, master's in business and science. So sort of the, the collaborative piece there. So this is great. Um, this is actually providing a, next, a nice segue into the next piece that I was going to talk about, focusing a little bit more on the ATRL revisions. But definitely keep, keep the thoughts coming. I definitely want this to be more of a conversation than me talking at you. So, so changing landscapes. So now I really want to shift the gears more towards the current work of the ATRL information Literacy, competency, standards for higher education. A mouthful. Um, so, again, quick background. The ACRL Information Literacy Standards were first published in 2000. In 2012, uh, the first review of the standards occurred with a really strong recommendation from the task force that the standards need to be extensively revised. Uh, starting in 2013, so this year, a task force was convened, and we are currently working on revisions. The revisions are tentatively scheduled to be shared sort of in a draft form sometime this spring, February, March, um, with ideally a final version seeking ACRL board approval at ALA annual uh, this summer. So this is sort of where it gets tricky for me. Um, our, our work is really a work in progress on the, the task force right now. Um, everything is in, in draft form. So what I really want to talk about are three models for information literacy, and I'm really using the term model very loosely, um, but three models that are really serving as a foundation for our revisions. Um, so the Sconal Seven Pillars model, uh, the idea or concept of meta literacy, and then um, information about threshold concepts. So the, um, the SCONAL Seven Pillars model is a model uh, from the UK, uh, from higher education institutions in the UK, and it was first published in 2011. Now the model here is really, um, it re-envisions information literacy not as a set of prescriptive standards, um, but as really a stripped down core model of information literacy. You can see the seven pillars 
manage, evaluate, present, gather, identify, plan, and scope. Um, you know, this model really defines skills and competencies, as well as attitudes and behaviors at the heart of information literacy. So one of the cool things about this model is it's really envisioned as a three-dimensional circular building um, founded on an information landscape which comprises the information world as it appears at that point in time to an individual. So it really is an acknowledgement that information literacy is not a linear process, we move from A to B, but a continuing holistic process where individuals can develop across the seven pillars, both simultaneously and independently. Um, and meta literacy. So, meta literacy is a concept that was introduced by Thomas Massey and Trudy Jacobson. And Trudy is one of the two uh, chairs of the, the revision task force. Meta literacy um, really envisions information literacy as active knowledge production and distribution in collaborative online communities. So it really is about both consumption and production. Um, meta literacy also builds practical connections and reinforces central lifelong learning goals among different literacy types. So again, weaves together or actually serve as an umbrella for different meta or different literacy types. And then um, Meta literacy also focuses on multiple learning domains. So there are the behaviors, so the skills you need to be information literate. Cognitive behaviors, um, so the knowledge you need to understand the informational world. And then effective behaviors, sort of how you understand information or your attitude towards information. Um, traditionally, information literacy is focused more on behavioral and cognitive, so the effective is really a new dimension that's being added to the concept of information literacy. And then threshold concepts, one of my new favorite things. Um, so threshold concepts are the core ideas and processes that define the way of thinking and practicing for a discipline. So the central concepts that transform and integrate students' view of content and bring insight into how to really think like a practitioner themselves. So threshold concepts really um, have five key criteria. So first, they're transformative. They cause the learner to experience a complete shift in perspective. They're integrative. They bring together separate concepts, often identified as learning objects or competencies, and they bring them together as a unified whole. Uh, threshold concepts are irreversible. Once grasped, you can't ungrasp them. You can't unlearn them. They're troublesome. Um, threshold concepts often are so foundational that it becomes counterintuitive, but these really are the places where students stumble or get stuck with their understanding of a discipline. And they're bounded. Um, threshold concepts really help define the boundaries of a particular discipline and are generally unique to a discipline. So for example, uh, one such threshold concept for information literacy is format as a process. So it really gets at the heart of what is the difference between a journal and a website? Or even taking it further, what's the difference between a journal article on, online and a journal article that gets photocopied? So the threshold concept would really need to focus on student understanding that the format of information is the result of a process, that information is packaged in different formats because of how it was recreated and how it was shared. So the new information literacy framework being developed is relying heavily on threshold concepts, so transformative concepts that when really taken together develop a complex picture of information that is seen. Um, the concepts are also being developed with a mind towards addressing multiple learning domains, including effective learning domains. So again, I want to open this up for, for discussion. Um, the SCOTL model offer, offers a significant change in how information literacy can be envisioned. Does this model resonate with you?
Ricardo. Yeah, Linda says, my students are not at one stage of IL, but at many points. And that's so true about um, the Sconal model is that depending on the research question, they could be developing in one area and quote unquote regressing in another. It's a very fluid system um, where it really is predicated by the research question. It definitely is a, a way to reframe our approach. Um, I can say that the standards are not going to be standards anymore. I don't know what we will be calling them, um, but they will look very different in how they're being modeled because, because of what is implied, um, largely what is implied by listing of standard one, standard two, standard three, standard four, standard five. Uh, possibly a framework. It will definitely take uh, it will definitely take a while to realign um, guidelines. Not a toolkit. Okay. Well. <laughs> so let me bring us to another another just topic question here. So, what does meta literacy mean to you? How is it different or the same from our current concept of information literacy? Is meta literacy a new concept for for you? Okay, meta literacy is growing on John. Yeah, I think, um, oh, it's scrolling too fast. I think Margaret just made a really good point that um, the new standards are hopefully, the new standards, new standards, whatever, are hopefully uh, bringing this document in line with what many of us are already doing. She says meta literacy better describes information opportunities now. Yes, I would I would agree. Um, sort of the tacit inclusion of both production and consumption is huge for me. And yes, meta literacy is always better than listing dozens and dozens and dozens of literacies. <laughs> All right, so one more discussion question here to throw at you. So threshold concepts suggest that information literacy learning concepts need to be transformative, right? They need to change, change our students and their ways of thinking, their habits of mind. Are the current information literacy competencies transformative? If not, can you think of any examples of transformative learning concepts for information literacy? And I guess this question is really making you do the work of the task force, but I'm curious, again, are threshold concepts something that are new to you? Um, and if so, does it make sense within a new framework?
Okay, so it is sort of a new new approach. Um, so yeah, there is some question about sort of this, the stickiness of threshold concepts because they are new. Sue says that the competencies a decade ago may have been transformative, but now they're not. So Bruce writes, he's seen information literacy skills transform from a humanities course to a technical discipline. I'm not sure. Can you elucidate? So Linda says the teaching and learning is transformative, not the information literacy concepts. That statement intrigues me a lot. Um, in the article that I listed for threshold concepts, which I recommend people reading just because it's a really good, both theoretical and practical read. Um, but going to what John, John just wrote, that many of the older standards are either trivial or not applicable, um, the Threshold Concepts article really, um, it highlighted how the standards are either really way too insanely broad or way too insanely specific, and that the range of it makes it very difficult uh, to either interpret it or use it in a meaningful way. Bonnie asks, are there particular disciplines who currently use threshold concepts? I want to say, and this is me not remembering offhand, I think it started in like geology, geography. Um, hang on, let me see if I can find the article. So John writes that um, students are a researcher, like the ones they're seeing in papers by. Yes, students have a place in the conversation of scholarship, um, and we don't do a very, very good job of acknowledging that. Um, so Bruce, Bruce followed up with my question. So, you know, students learn about academic search in the air. Uh, you try to teach them Scopus, but they say academic search in the air is broad enough. Um, you're glad that when they use academic search in the air instead of Google. Right, and then Linda says, you know, it's, it's almost like a discovery service. Um, so again, uh, you know, if we were thinking about these things as, as a threshold concept, what, what do we need to be transformative about this? Because right now we're talking about teaching specific skills to students. You need to go here, you need to go there, don't go here. But that's not necessarily transformative, right? Um, I tell my five-year-old, no, you can't do that, and she does it anyway. So what makes these concepts transformative? How do we get them to understand or have it be sticky about where, where information comes from, um, where authority comes from? How many librarians still need to reach IELTS threshold? I'm pretty sure a lot of us do. <laughs> um, and can we agree on threshold concepts? No, I don't think that. I think that this in some ways is the devil's work in the, the review, um, the revisions, because 
I don't think there will ever be consensus in this field. I think that there are very broad perspectives. Um, uh, there's a very deep history of what we do that, um, you know, coming to a shared, I'm hopeful we can come to a shared understanding, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how far we'll get in consensus. So here, I'm going to just throw out broadly some of the threshold concepts or learning concepts that the revision task force is sort of thinking about, banding around, um, whether or not any or all of these make it into whatever final framework is to be seen, which is why this is all very draft at this point. Um, authority is constructed and contextual. Information as a commodity. Information creation and curation. Information is socially constructed. The nature of evidence is disciplinary. Format is a process. Research is inquiry and knowledge generation. Research question drives results. Scholarship is a conversation. Searching is not magic. And synthesis equals thinking. So one of the big changes that you may notice about these concepts is that um, it, they're almost like discussion points. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an intentional and tacit move away from being very prescriptive in what we teach um, and making it more a, more bounded discipline of information science, not a that we're creating, you know, little librarians, but that we are creating people who understand that information is part of a larger discipline. So John says, there's a definite need for SES to get right on extending them into STEM. I second that. So with that, let me actually, how would these be assessed? That is really the big question right now. And this is why I'm saying this is a draft. Um, we are talking about different assessment methods for each threshold concept, um, but they are, they are works in progress. So let me seg sort of into the, the third piece of this. Um, so how can, all of this work translate into FTS's future revisions of information literacy um, in science, engineering, technology. So this is where I get to do a little bit of theorizing, but I'm also really intrigued to hear what others think in this regard. So beyond silos, in the science and engineering, complex problems are being solved across or without disciplinary boundaries. Collaborative research needs to transcend individual disciplinary perspectives. Students in the sciences need to understand the social, political, economic, aesthetic, legal facets of the complex real-world problems that they're being asked to solve. The trend towards active learning and problem-based learning has really a cascading effect on information literacy. Our new model needs to be progressive and scaffolded based on the curricula. One-shot library sessions are no longer sufficient if we want to be meaningful about embedding critical and creative thinking skills into the curriculum. Beyond consumption, um, the sciences have really seen a structural and cultural redesign of how knowledge is produced. Methodologies such as e-science emphasize different ways in which we access, manipulate, and create information or knowledge. Students aren't just consumers, but they're also producers. This leads us to questions about authority. This opens the door to scholarship as a conversation. It really brings to the forefront questions about how students create, preserve, and disseminate information. Beyond information literacy, students need more than just information literacy to be successful in their disciplines. 
that need to be competent with data and data information literacy, visual literacy, media literacy, technological literacy. They also need to develop professional skills, communication, problem solving, teamwork, ethical behavior. In particular, it needs to be acknowledged in the standards that learning is collaborative, learning has a social context, and that the process is as important as the product. And then beyond competency standards, um, gone should be the prescriptive and inflexible standards. It's time to really shift our narrative away from thinking about information literacy as a complicated, insulated system and begin thinking about it as a complex system that is interactive and iterative, a system that is diverse, made up of multiple interconnected elements, skills, knowledge, behavior, multiple literacies, and a system that's dynamic, one that can adapt to change and grow through an individual's experience. So with that, I want to sort of leave the last, last bit here to really open up the conversation um, and, and see, read what you think about future models for information literacy in the sciences or even more generally information literacy um, topics you want to discuss. For IL assessment, um, again, what what do you mean by that? Um, you, you say standardized tests, and I go SAT. Um, so Bonnie writes, "Oh, like sales? That's an interesting question. Um, I I know of sales. I've never used it, uh, so I don't know exactly what sales asks as far as assessment." It doesn't seem that many people are talking about it as much anymore. No. I, so from my personal view, I don't think multiple choice questions can ever truly get at the heart of information literacy. Um, it's, I think one of the thing, one of our occasional failings is that it's not integrated, that we try and have it exist alone, um, you know, attached to a assignment, or even worse, that professor who calls and says, I just need a babysitter for a day, they're coming to the library. I think that for information literacy to really continue being taken seriously, being taken more seriously as we progress, um, you know, we need to move away from the one shots and the, the standardized evaluations and look at it holistically, tracking across an entire student's career. So David asks, how would you reconcile uh, the use of research to mean literature review with research to mean testing in the field? I think um, that question in particular uh, really needs to be part of a discussion on, you know, evidence is disciplinary and really an understanding of what kind of information you need when. Yes, I will go back a slide. I feel like I missed some questions, so I'm just scrolling up here.
David, you make a really good point um, that librarians uh, or the role of information literacy often is selectively part of the curriculum. And I think that's a big piece of what needs to be changed. And as part of the revisions, we're really keeping a mind towards the stakeholders. Um, you know, there's sort of the, the dual tension of this threshold concept on the one hand that so like information literacy is part of the discipline of, of you know, library and information science, but on the other hand, we recognize that the standards, the current standards in this bit are very library and needs, jargon, um, and that needs to be rectified because the, the conversation sort of stall because we're not speaking to others. Uh, our other stakeholders in terms of they understand. And I had a second point and I lost it, sorry. Margaret asked a really interesting question. So what are some of the ways non-librarians refer to what we call information literacy? I don't really know. Um, it really, it's, it's really hard to separate information literacy from skills like writing in the disciplines, right? And so I think people understand information literacy and research as a thing. But as far as um, critical thinking research methods, right, they, they sort of frame it in, in broader senses. Knowledge creation. And one could argue that by referring to it as critical thinking research methods, knowledge creation, we again are giving away our stake in the conversation. And again, that's part of the whole tension. Um, we want to be a part of the conversation. We don't necessarily want to own it completely. But where on that, where on the spectrum does it does it really fall? This discussion is key to the future, Sue. I, I think many of these discussions are key to the future. Again, because we're all coming at it from such diverse viewpoints, um, sort of what we believe, how we believe we should be instructing, um, where we fit into curricula. I think, you know, continuing the conversation and keeping open-minded, it's going to be a difficult transition for some. Um, some are very excited about it, and there are a lot in the middle who may be ambivalent, and we recognize that. And so being sure to remain open to these discussions and to hearing all viewpoints. Um, you know, originally, the, the revisions task force for the ACRL was all like, let's get rid of the standards, just burn them down, get rid of them completely. And then we took a step back and we're like, oh, yeah, that'd be really bad. There are a lot of people who this has been you know, their go-to document for near on 15 years. We can't just throw it out. Um,
ETF for the completion of the new standards. Uh, in theory, we this summer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yes, optimistically, ALA annual with hopefully drafts out well before that. Um, John wrote something about intellectual property literacy, and I was pulling up. So one of the threshold concepts that is sort of in development is is one of the more intriguing ones to me: information as a commodity. So um, you know the value of information. Um, information poverty issues, um, as well as, you know, intellectual property as it's owned by a creator and used for economic gain. I think um, intellectual property is a huge piece to this. And yes, it took everybody 15 years to be part of Gen Ed, and hopefully this will push us towards whatever the next threshold is. And hopefully Gen Ed is, is slowly but systematically killing one shot session. Man, I can't, don't even get me started. Oh, Margaret, I'm right there with you. What is it? What does it? What does it even mean? Teach them for 30 minutes of online coaching. I'm starting to see attrition in our our participation numbers. It seems that the the questions are slowly petering out here. So again, I'm, I'm putting out my contact information. Um, this is something that I very much love talking about. Um, in fact, love so much more when I can actually hear other people talking with me about it. Um, and so I encourage you, if you have questions, I know that I was sufficiently vague in what the ACRL revisions are looking like. And it's not because I'm trying to be difficult, but because I don't want to overpromise. <laughs> Um, yeah, so do your thing. Just do whatever you do. That's okay. I believe that there are open forums scheduled at midwinter. Um, I need to double check on that because the draft of the revisions has gotten bumped back. But I believe that there are some scheduled. I will happily send it out to the STS listserv when I have confirmation. Um, Thank you for pointing um, pointing the recordings out, Bonnie. Those if there were three open forum held early on, where you can get a glimpse of, of some of the things that I talked about, including a couple of the threshold concepts, um, learning concepts that that we're investigating. I believe format as a process was one of them. Even if you don't want to go through and listen to all three recordings, um, there is some interesting stuff in those that might give you a broader picture. And likewise, there is, um, if you want to track the progress of the revisions, you can check it out on that website.
Any last questions for Elizabeth? Thank you, Allison. So yes, there you go. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I want to say thank you again, Elizabeth, very much for your uh, leadership today in this chat discussion. I really appreciate it, and I know that uh, from the very active conversation in the chat box there, everybody was interested, engaged, had lots of questions, so we really appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so everybody, if you are not on the STS listserv, you can uh, contact me if you want a link to the recording. Otherwise, we will be sending a link out to the STS listserv. I'll put my email address in the um, chat box there. Okay, well, thank you very much, and perhaps we'll see you again next month.